Hi, my name is Boyce and welcome to Headspace. Today we'll be talking about fathers with autistic children. I'm joined by two gentlemen, Dr. Neville Paulson, um, as well as Tabo Maganete, who is a father of an autistic child who will be joining us telephonically. The main focus today is about or is around um, the communication, behavioural and building a relationship with children with autism. So Tabo, who happens to be on the line, I have a question for you. Um, with regards to building a relationship, a father-son relationship with your son, as well as communication and some of the behavioural challenges that you've experienced with him, would you care to just elaborate in terms of your experience in that regard? I guess the one thing that I've always wanted to do was to um, share my wisdom with my son, so to speak. Um, but his speech was quite slow and I realized that um, quite a bit late, later on. Um, and he preferred to be alone most of the time, um, which was quite strange. And whenever anyone tried to be around him, he would sort of get agitated and so on. Um, I also realized that he liked stacking things up. Um, you could actually stack three two liter Coke bottles together on top of each other. So yeah, I, that's one of the things that made me realize that um, there is something up there. And um, I think the biggest thing was the fact that I couldn't sort of talk to him and communicate with him in a way that that I know best, so I had to learn new ways of communicating, sort of. So Dr. Neville, it sounds like, you know, it was quite a, a difficult journey for Tabo, you know, and a bit frustrating, I think, for him in that regard. So maybe if you could just tell us a bit about the biological aspects, you know, in terms of autism and, and you know, how it manifests through the behaviour of the autistic child. Well, I'm sure during the progress of the show, we'll learn a little bit more about autism and how to pick up s certain symptoms and signs in a child. But um, I'm going to start off by just explaining to you, by asking what causes autism, you know? Um, I think that's a good place to, to start. The truth is we don't really know. There's a few studies to suggest certain causes, um, one of them being genetic. There are numerous other, other causes as well. We think that toxins during pregnancy could predispose the neurological development of, of the child. We know that in the first and the third trimester of pregnancy, uh, you know, certain toxins, like for example, alcohol, you know, a lot of girls don't know in their first trimester that they are actually, actually expecting. So that little sip now and then could actually, uh, you know, cause quite uh, severe abnormalities in a child that they, that they don't know. Um, varicella or um, the, the rubella virus, uh, which is more commonly known as the measles or the German measles virus. A lot of people have, had, have been exposed to German measles or varicella. I'm now interested to find out what our fathers on the streets actually think about um, having an autistic child. I'm joined by my co-host Dumi, who also happens to be a stepmother to an autistic child, who's wondering exactly the same thing. Over to you, Dumi. It is, uh, you know, since I don't know much about autism, but the problem is uh, if my son uh, uh, diagnoses autism, I would suggest to go for the doctors mm -hmm. and also find the people who know much better about that for counselling or something like that. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, I think uh, this cannot be easy for any family, uh, mm. obviously depending on uh, how you learn about it, but when the child is particularly young, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't think it will get easier, mm. but it's stuff that you just get used to, mm. and uh, it's effects that you just have to la live with, mm. and all you need to do is to obviously just support them. I will say, I'll accept it because it's my kid, and I can help yeah, or him at mm. home to learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been school work, everything I can help him. Okay. I think the first emotion probably would be surprise, mm -hmm. but I think then, you know, soon after that you'd want to be as supportive as possible, mm -hmm. trying to find help and learn more about autism. Yes, yes. Look, wow, it's not easy. I guess one is obviously a uh, doctor. I would have to consult my doctor, uh, family, friends, and definitely the internet. I guess that's where I will end up going for, 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 for help. 
Mm. I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm sure I've heard of the auto, autism societies and associations, so the support groups. I think a lot of the schools, because it's, it's a broad spectrum where, um, you know, some kids cannot even operate in a normal school, and then you have these really super smart kids that have Asperger's and things like that. So you may even find parents within your school that have a sibling. So I think the starting point will probably be at the school, mm. and then, you know, moving out to some kind of community support or social network. No. Mm. <laughs> So to me, it seems like he had quite an interesting um, time out on the streets with the fathers um, and asking them about, you know, how it would be to have an autistic child. Um, tell me a bit about that. Um, what do you think were the most prominent things that you picked up from, from the fathers that you spoke to? I think for me, you know, the most prominent thing was the anxiety. You know, just by posing that question to them, it was quite anxiety provoking for them. And it was quite lovely to see that at that point in time, when I asked them the question, they actually took a moment to be in that headspace of wondering how, would it, how it would actually be like to be a parent to an autistic child. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was a bit of a mind shift because they were able to kind of put themselves in the parents' shoes to try and imagine the possibilities of that. Mm -hmm. So that was quite interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting that you touch on anxiety. I think maybe if we could ask Tabo in that regard, you know, um, Tabo, uh, what would you say, you know, your experience um, was, you know, can you just kind of deconstruct it a bit for us in terms of, you know, what emotional experience you went through after finding out that your son was autistic? Well, I think in terms of the anxieties, one does feel a bit helpless in a way, because um, there's very little that you can do as a parent, but um, I've seen extremely active parents, um, and you know, it's, it's tough not knowing what is it that you need to do, although the resources are there, um, not knowing at what what can actually help. Um, because if you look at autism, it's a spectrum itself. And post-diagnosis, my son's diagnosis was um, quite high actually in terms of the spectrum itself. So um, it's one of those where, you know, it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong thing. Um, so yes, you feel quite a bit helpless um, about what it is that you can actually do. So, Dr. Paulson, you know, we've just heard from Tabo, you know, for him, the emotional reactions varied from feeling helpless and a lot of anxiety. So, it would be quite interesting to find out from you as a practitioner, how do you go about diagnosing autism? And mostly as well, how do you then communicate that information back to the parents? Well, you know, autism is usually diagnosed in the very early stages of the child's development, usually in the toddler or infant age range of the child. And it's normally the mothers who are mothering the child and they see that this child's not developing like other children do. You know, they, they notice, for example, that the child doesn't smile, the child doesn't interact the way that other children do. Children and humans look at the triangle of the face and they look at that area to see emotion, the look, and you can see anger, happiness, frustration. These children look everywhere else um, except in that triangle. So they, for example, parents would smile at the child and the child doesn't smile back, you know, and familiar faces, the child just doesn't respond. And the mother usually notices that the child also doesn't develop at the same ages but or the same way that other children do. Mm -hmm. They also don't respond to pain uh, or to other stimuli as well. They normally have flapping of the hands or repetitive movements. That's usually a bit later on in, 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 but that's usually the time when the mother takes the child to the doctor, you know, and she notices certain traits of uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction or mental retardation. Mm -hmm. um, and the last term is not meant in a derogatory way, but that is what most people know it as. Mm -hmm. We prefer to use the term cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. 
And she takes the child to the doctor and from there, you know, there is no blood test to, to diagnose this. Yeah. It, it's a clinical diagnosis. Mm. And, you know, we, we then refer the child on to, to a pedi- uh, pediatrician or a neurologist and, and, you know, and from there onwards the diagnosis is given. And that's the part that is most traumatic, yeah. hearing that news. Yes. Is your child autistic or not? Oh, no. You know, th- that is the most, most difficult part of the, the condition, you yeah. know. So, yeah, it's... And on that note, sorry, Dumi. No and on that note, um, tell me, Dr. Paul Paulson, it, it, it is said that um, autism is commonly found, um, you know, in boys rather than in <laughs> girls. So if you could just tell us a bit in terms of that. Boys are more commonly seen to have autism and the ratio is usually around about four to one. You know, so for every four... Um, boys, one girl, one girl has autism. Mm. And the sad thing about it is, is that around about 87% of these children will never be able to live an independent life as an adult, mm. be able to drive, go to school, university, and they need constant care, 24 hours su- supervision. Mm. Um, however, there are 10% of children with autism who can live normal lives, mm. independent lives. But that is, that is the minority of the, of the group. So typically when, you know, after a diagnosis has been made of the child and then it's obviously then communicated to yes. the parents, how typically, how, how do the parents respond to that? How do they react to such news? How do you respond to news that your child has a condition that no one knows much about? Mm-hmm. There isn't a lot of research going on about it. Um, you know, it's very expensive to, to treat this and, you know, and does your medical aid cover this condition? You know, how do you respond to this? You know, it, it's not an easy answer. And, and you know, that's, that's something that, that, that we, you know, unfortunately um, don't have a lot of control over. Mm. I mean, I like what you're saying, you know, in terms of how do you respond to it as a parent? How, how, where do you even go about doing all of that? Of so, you know, as a parent, knowing that now your child is autistic, yes. are there any health resources in which that I can try and find and go to and things like that? You know, to me, in a country like South Africa, as fantastic as we are, mm. um, we unfortunately have a large population that is unemployed mm. and they don't have access to health care and they don't have knowledge of, you know, it, it, whereas in other countries there is a lot of resources available. And here, sadly enough, you know, it, it's, these parents sit with this condition and, and in many instances, there isn't a lot of help. Mm. Um, you don't have an au pair to look after the child. You've got to go to work. Mm. You've got to look after the child. Their immune systems are also weaker. So they have a lot of infections, you know, like chest infections and, and so forth. So, um, you know, it, it def- definitely is not an easy thing. And a young dad, for that matter, yeah. you know, yeah. breadwinners. Yeah. We've got to go out and work, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, we don't stand in the mirror and look pretty yeah. or, you know. Cuss, and cuss, cuss. I shouldn't even be saying that, but a lot of women, uh, when get time off, you know, with with maternity leave. Mm-hmm. So they've got time with the child and they can stay with the child in the beginning stage. But a single father, as your as your caller, I mean, he, he has to work. I mean he and 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 uh, he doesn't have the luxury of a of a of a wife at home. Mm. And tell me, doctor, in terms of research now, you know, because a lot of the stats and, 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 and everything that we're reading up, <laughs> I know, that we're reading up on um, of late is, is very much, you know, a, a global, yes. on a global sphere. Um, in terms of the South African context, do you know, you know as a medical practitioner, well, know of any research that's been done? It's difficult to think global with the local um, situation we have here in this part of the world, there isn't a lot of funding. You know, funding, funding, funding. For research, you need funding. Europe, America, there's a lot of funding out for this sort of thing. But sadly enough, we've got fantastic health professionals that are very well versed and very knowledgeable on this condition. But there just isn't enough funding for for research regarding this in this part of the world. You know, it's quite interesting. What Dr. Paulson is basically trying to give us an idea of is everything that is necessary to try to, um, you know, in the health-wise, to try to cater to your child that is autistic. Absolutely. It's so, there's so many different things in which you can go about them. Mm. So can you imagine only in terms of the public services that are provided, that what are the limitations to it all? Absolutely. Because obviously there's only a certain point in which they can go as Jimmy, well. Jimmy, can I, can I give you a simple example? Mm. Yes. 
in a good average home with enough income and resources. It's as simple as going to your doctor and then scheduling an appointment with your specialist. Mm. In other settings, you know, um, even though those facilities are available, they are limited. They are limited. It takes a long hour, a long queue, sitting with the child, having to take off from work, because they always they have a lot of uh, infections and their immune systems are weak. So, you know, you have the stress of, of your boss at work, complaining about you taking off from, from work and, and all of that, and worrying how you're going to get fare for the taxi in and out of the hospital, or, you know, uh, it, 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 it gets a bit tough. You know, it, 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 it really does. So it, it, it's not easy. No. And medical aid services, do they pay for most of these um, services that we're throwing out there saying, you know, Just there's so many health issues you know? that we need to focus on and pay for? I do was they waiting. help? I was waiting for that. Do they help? <laughs> well, in my, you know, it's, it's uh, f the resources available are only as good as your medical aid and the cover that they extend to you. And that's, that's all that I can say. Good. I want us to go back um, slightly to, to Tabo for a second. So Tabo, your son is 16 um, years of age and he had quite an early diagnosis um, at the age of three. Um, I would like to know a bit more in terms of um, resources. You know, who did you ask? Where did you go? The internet, I think, was probably the biggest resource that I had because that's where I basically researched um, all of his early developmental issues um, and basically his behavior. Um, it was, there was quite a lot of information about that. Um, all I had to do was, was basically search for behavior patterns and then it led me to understanding that uh, what this, um, what this monster called, or I shouldn't call it a monster actually, what um, autism is all about uh, and, and what it means and what it leads to and so on and so forth. Um, the biggest disappointment I suppose was, 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 was the fact that it can't really be cured um, as, a, um, as a condition um, and that it will stay with him um, lifelong basically. Um, but yes, he attends a special school and um, it's a pretty good school, it's a government school um, and I think it's, it specializes on, on autism specifically um, and it's supported by Autism South Africa. So, so I think there's a lot that they have done in terms of his, his, his development. Um, I, I think there's a lot more that, that they are definitely going to do. Very interesting. Thank you, Tabo, for that. Um, I think it's also given us a bit of insight, you know, in terms of you did say that your son was diagnosed when you were 22, in terms of, you know, how that journey in itself was. Now, to me, um, as a stepmom to an autistic um, child, please, if you could just tell us a bit about, you know, some of the lovely moments that you've shared with your son in this regard. Um, there's been plenty, of course, but for me, I'd say that the moment he gives me a level of um, attention to me, you know, especially when he's maintaining eye contact. That split second is heaven to Maintaining me. eye contact? Just maintaining eye that contact. That is rare. Me. That yes. is rare. And that, that for rare. me is, for me, the best moments I can have with him. Um, the school did tell us that he, you know, he enjoys playing the drums. So we bought him his first set and How we, was that? it was very loud <laughs> and we couldn't get a moment of silence. But, um, you know, just seeing him happy like that. And I do understand that, you know, as parents to autistic children, it is, you know, the ups and downs to the doctor's visitations and all this, making sure that they get the necessary medication. It can have a toll on you. But, you know, if you have the support, appreciate it. And if you don't seek it, yeah. you can't survive without support. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. Um, thank you to Tabo as well for joining us telephonically, and I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Can, can I just interject with one last thing? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what people need to know about, um, once it, you asked early on about the diagnosis, once it's made, mm. you know, parents need to know that this is a lifelong commitment to this child. Mm. Um, and things to consider are, for example, sexual abuse. A lot of these children are actually violated, you know, so to always look out for that when you have a child like this and that they would need a lot of love, a lot of care. And, um, you know, it, and, and the 
educators at school need to also know how to deal with this, mm, with, this with this condition. Yeah, nice. Well, there you have it from Dr. Paulson himself. Thank you once again to Tabo Maganete. Um, and thank you, Dr. Paulson, for being on the show. Um, catch us next time on Headspace, uh, where we'll be discussing the accessibility um, around resources um, with regards to mental health. Should you need to contact us, please um, look us up on smartchaos.coza. <laughs>